on page 66. Stop and think. Para. A key text in post-structuralism is Derrida's Book of Grammatology. The slogan, quote, there is nothing outside the text, unquote, is the most frequently quoted line from this book, but it is usually quoted out of context to justify a kind of extreme textualism, whereby it is held that all reality is linguistic, so that there can be no meaningful talk of a real, real within court, world which exists without question outside language. Para. It is becoming common today to deny that such a view is the one actually put forward by Derrida, and while I do not recommend that you attempt to tackle the whole book at this stage, you could put yourself considerably ahead of many commentators and critics by acquiring a detailed knowledge of the section of the book in which this remark occurs using the intensive reading technique I describe in the introduction. The section is subheaded, quote, the exorbitant full stop, question of method, unquote, pages 157 to 164, para. Derrida is writing in this section about Rousseau's, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U apostrophe S, quote, essay on the origin of languages, unquote, but he stops to question his own method of interpreting this text and hence the nature of all interpretation. He debates the concept of the, quote, supplement, unquote, a word which in French can also mean a replacement in the sense that language replaces or stands in for reality. Bracket. This idea is outlined in the immediately preceding pages of grammatology, pages 141 to 157. But what exactly is the nature of this standing in, within quote, since, quote, the person writing is inscribed in a determined textual system, unquote, page 160, which is to say that we all inherit language as a ready-made system with its own history, philosophy, and so on, already, quote, built in, unquote, question mark. In this sense, one might argue that we don't express ourselves in words merely some aspect of language. Indent. The writer writes in a language and in a logic whose proper systems, comma, laws, comma, and life, his discourse by definition, cannot dominate absolutely full stop. He uses them by only letting himself, comma, after a fashion and up to a point, comma, be governed by the system. And the reading must always aim at a certain relationship unperceived by the writer between what he commands and what he does does not command of the patterns of the language that he uses. Stop. This relationship is not page 67, a certain quantitative distribution of shadow and light, comma, of weakness or of force, but a signifying structure that critical reading should produce. Indent withdrawn, Derrida of Chromatology, page 158, para. Reading and interpretation, then, are not just reproducing what the writer thought and expressed in the text, this inadequate notion of interpretation Derrida calls a, quote, doubling commentary, unquote, since it tries to reconstruct a pre-existing non-textual reality, bracket, of what the writer did or thought, bracket closed, to lay alongside the text. Instead, critical reading must produce the text, since there is nothing behind it for us to reconstruct. Thus, the reading has to be deconstructive rather than reconstructive in this issue. This is the point where Derrida makes the remark which he later calls, quote, the axial proposition of this essay, comma, that there is nothing outside the text, unquote, of Grammatology, page 163. Indent, 
reading dot 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 cannot legitimately transgress the text towards something other than it dot 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 or toward a signified outside the text whose content could take place could have taken place outside of language that is to say in the sense that we give here to that word outside of writing in general that is why the methodological considerations that we risk applying here to an example are closely dependent on general propositions that we have elaborated above semicolon as regards the absence of the referent or the transcendental signified full stop there is nothing outside of the text stop indent close of grammatology page 158 para he expands this further and retreads that quote beyond and behind what one believes can be circumscribed as rousseau's text there has never been anything but writing dot 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 what opens meaning and language is writing as the disappearance of natural presence unquote page 159 para you will not find these pages of derida by any means easy but they will repay some intensive work ideally in group discussion do they enable you to pin down precisely what derida is saying about the relationship between word and world and are his views as stark and uncompromising as they are often accused of being question mark the section stop and think closes page 68 structuralism and post structuralism some practical differences para an initial problem here is that post structuralism often claims that it is more an attitude of mind than a practical method of criticism this is in a sense quite true but perhaps no more true of post structuralism than of any other critical orientation after all in what sense could say marxist or feminist dash or even liberal humanist dash criticism be called a method only in the loosest way surely since none of these provide anything like a step by step procedure for analyzing literary works all they offer is an orientation towards a characteristic central issue bracket that is towards issues of class gender and personal morality comma respectively bracket closed and a body of work which constitutes a repertoire of examples stop para what then seem to be the characteristics of post structuralism as a critical method the post structuralist literary critic is engaged in the task of quote deconstructing unquote the text this process is given the name quote deconstruction unquote which can roughly be defined as applied post structuralism it is often referred to as quote reading against the grain or reading the text against itself unquote with the purpose of quote not knowing the text as it cannot know itself unquote bracket there are terry eagleton's definitions bracket closed a way of describing this would be to say that deconstructive reading uncovers the unconscious rather than the conscious dimension of the text all the things which its overt textuality glosses over or fails to recognize this repressed unconscious within language might be sensed for instance in the example used earlier when we said that the word guest is a cognate with bracket that is has the same original root as bracket closed the word host which in turn comes from the latin word hostis meaning an enemy this hints at the potential double aspect of a guest as either welcome or unwelcome or as changing from one to the other this notion of hostility then is like the repressed unconscious of the word and the process of deconstruction in revealing the unconscious of the text might draw upon such disciplines as etymology in this way
para. Another well-known definition of deconstructive reading is Barbara Johnson's in The Critical Difference, Johns Hopkins University Press, 1980. Indent. Deconstruction is not synonymous with destruction. It is, in fact, much closer to the original meaning of the word analysis, which, page 69, etymologically means to undo. Dot, dot, dot. The deconstruction of a text does not proceed by random doubt or arbitrary subversion, but by the careful teasing out of warring forces of signification within the text. In then close, Johnson, The Critical Difference, page 5. Derrida's own description of deconstructive reading has the same purport. A deconstructive reading, indent, must always aim at a certain relationship, unperceived by the writer, between what he commands and what he does, does not command of the patterns of language that he uses, dot, 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 parenthesis, eat, parenthesis closes, attempts to make the not seen accessible to sight. Of, and then closed of grammatology pages 158 and 163. J. A. Cudden, C-U-D-D-O-N, in his Dictionary of Literary Terms, asserts that in deconstruction, Indent. A text can be read as saying something quite different from what it appears to be saying. Dot, dot, dot. It may be read as carrying a plurality of significance or as saying many different things which are fundamentally at variance with, contradictory to and subversive of what may be seen by criticism as a single stable meaning. Thus a text may betray itself. Indent closed from the entry on deconstruction, para. So the deconstructionist practices what has been called textual harassment or oppositional reading, reading with the aim of unmasking internal contradictions or inconsistencies in the text, aiming to show the disunity which underlies its apparent unity. The aim of the new critics of the previous generation, by contrast, had been precisely the opposite of this, to show the unity beneath apparent disunity. In pursuance of its aims, the deconstructive process will often fix on a detail of the text which looks incidental, the presence of a particular metaphor, for instance, and then use it as the key to the whole text, so that everything is read through it. Para. In talking about structuralism, we discussed how structuralists look for such features in the text as parallels, echoes, reflections, and so on, page 51. The effect of doing this is often to show a unity of purpose within the text as if the text knows what it wants to do and has directed all its means towards this end. By contrast, the deconstructionist aims to show that the text is at war with itself. It is a house divided and disunified. The deconstructionist looks for evidence, page 70, of gaps, breaks, fissures, and discontinuities of all kinds. So a diagram showing the differences between structuralism and post-structuralism at the practical level might look like this. Left column, the structuralist seeks, S-E-E-K-S. -E the right column, the post-structuralist seeks. I shall read first from left, then right. Left, parallels slash echoes, right, contradictions slash paradoxes. Left, balances, right, shifts slash breaking, cologne, tone, viewpoint, tense, time, person, attitude. Left, reflections slash repetitions, right, conflicts. Left, symmetry, right, absences slash omissions. Left, contrasts, right, linguistic quirks, Q-U-I-R-K-S. Left, patterns, right, aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A. Left, effect, to show textual unity and coherence. Right, effect, to show textual disunity.
Para, in presenting the example, I'll refer back to this list and will also suggest a simple three-stage model of the deconstructive process. I'll end with some questions to help you to try your own worked example. Section, what post-structuralist critics do? 1. They read the text against itself so as to expose what might be thought of as the textual subconscious, where meanings are expressed which may be directly contrary to the surface meaning. 2. They fix upon the surface features of the words, similarities in sound, the root meanings of words, a dead, dead within quote, or dying metaphor, dash, and bring these to the foreground so that they become crucial to the overall meaning. 3. They seek to show that the text is characterized by disunity rather than unity. 4. They can concentrate on a single passage and analyze it so intensively that it becomes impossible to sustain a univocal reading and the language explodes into multiplicities of meaning. Page 71. 5. They look for shifts and breaks of various kinds in the text and see these as evidence of what is repressed or glossed over or passed over in silence by the text. These discontinuities are sometimes called fault lines, a ge geological metaphor referring to the breaks in rock formations which give evidence of previous activity and movement. Section Deconstruction an, an example. I try here to give a clear Example of deconstructive practice showing what is distinctive about it while at the same time suggesting it may not constitute a complete break with more familiar forms of criticism. The three stages of the de deconstructive process described here I have called the verbal, the textual and the linguistic. They are illustrated using Dylan Thomas's poem, A Refusal to Mourn the Death, by fire of a child in London, Appendix 2, Para. The verbal stage is very similar to that of more conventional forms of close reading as pioneered in the 1920s and 1930s in Empson's Seven Types of Ambiguity and elsewhere. It involves looking in the text for paradoxes and contradictions at what might be called the purely verbal level. For instance, the final line of Thomas's poem reads, quote, After the first death there is no other, unquote. The statement contradicts and refutes itself. If something is called the first, then a sequence is implied of second, third, fourth, and so on. So the phrase, quote, the first death, unquote, clearly implies at the literal level that there will be others. Internal contradictions of this kind are indicative for the quote deconstructionist comma of languages language apostrophe s endemic unreliability and slipperiness comma of which more will be said later. There are other examples of this kind in the poem. I don't know where the unquote sign went. Please look again at the poem and see if you can identify others. You might begin by considering the use of the word until in combination with never, para. One other facet of post-structuralism relevant here is its tendency to reverse the polarity of common binary oppositions like male and female, day and night, light and dark and so on, so that the second term rather than the first is privileged and regarded as the more desirable. Thus in the poem it seems to be darkness rather than light, which is seen as engendering life as the poet talks of good, the mankind, page 72, good, the mankind, making, slash, bird, beast and flower, slash, fathering and all humbling darkness, quote, closed, full stop. The paradox reflects the way the world of this poem is simultaneously a recognizable version of the world we live in and an inversion of that world.
For the deconstructionist, again, such moments are symptomatic of the way language doesn't reflect or convey our world but constitutes a world of its own, a kind of parallel universe or virtual reality. Identifying contradictory or paradoxical phrases like this, then, is the first step in going against the grain of the poem, reading it, quote, against itself, unquote, showing the, quote, signifiers, unquote, at war with the signified and revealing its repressed unconscious. This first stage will always turn up useful material for use in the later stages. Para, the textual stage of the method moves beyond the individual phrases and takes a more overall view of the poem. At this second stage, the critic is looking for shifts or breaks in the continuity of the poem. Cologne. These shifts reveal instabilities of attitude and hence the lack of a fixed and unified position. They can be of various kinds, bracket, as listed in the diagram given earlier, bracket closed. There may be shifts in focus, shifts in time or tone or point of view or attitude or pace or vocabulary. They may well be indicated in the grammar, for instance, in a shift from first person to third or past tense to present. Thus, they show paradox and contradiction on a larger scale than is the case with the first stage taking a broad view of the text as a whole. In the case of, quote, a refusal to mourn, unquote, for instance, there are major time shifts and changes in viewpoint, not a smooth chronological progression. Thus, coming of the end of the world, the last light breaks, the sea finally becomes still, the cycle which produces bird, beast and flower comes to an end as all humbling darkness descends. But the third stanza is centered on the present, the actual death of the child, quote, the majesty and burning of the child's death, unquote. The final stanza takes a broad vista like the first two, but it seems to center on the historical progression of the recorded history of London as witnessed by the unmourning water slash of the Reading Thames, unquote, full stop. Hence, no single wider context is provided to frame and contextualize the death of the child in a defined perspective, and the shifts in Thomas's poem make it very difficult to ground his meaning at all. Page 73, Para. Look again at the poem to see if you can detect other examples of this larger scale textual level of breaks and discontinuities. Note that omission up important here, that is, when a text doesn't tell us things we would expect to be told. You might begin by asking whether the poet tells us why he refuses to mourn, or rather why the expressed intention of not doing so is not carried out. Para, the linguistic stage finally involves looking for moments in the poem when the adequacy of language itself as a medium of communication is called into question. Such moments occur when, for example, there is implicit or explicit reference to the unreliability or untrustworthiness of language. It may involve, for instance, saying that something is unsayable or saying that it is impossible to utter or describe something and then doing so, or saying that language inflates or deflates or misrepresents its object and then continuing to use it anyway. In A Refusal to Mourn, for instance, the whole poem does what it says it won't do. The speaker professes his refusal to mourn, but the poem itself constitutes an act of mourning. Then in the third stanza, the speaker says, quote, murder slash the mankind of her going with a grave truth, unquote. This condemns all the accepted ways of speaking about this event and the poet professes to stand outside the available range of cliched, elegiac stances or discursive practices as if some pure stance beyond these necessarily compromised forms of utterance were possible. Yet this is followed not by silence but by the solemn quasi-liturgical pronouncements of the final stanza.
unquote, deep with the first dead lies London's daughter, unquote. The speaker proclaims, which sounds very like traditional panegyrical oratory, with a dead person transformed into some larger-than-life heroic figure, becoming, quote, London's daughter, unquote, bracket, an impossible designation for her life, bracket closed, within, quote, robed, R-O-B-E-D, as for some great procession of the dead of all the ages, and now reunited with Mother Earth in the form of the London clay, in which she is now buried, para. In this poem, we might say Thomas identifies the language trap and then falls into it. Look again at the poem with this textual level in mind. Are there other examples of Thomas's being forced to use the rhetorical strategies he has just exposed? You might start by looking at his use of the words mother and daughter and thinking, page 74, about the nature of the metaphorical family implied by these words. Other metaphorical constructs to look at are those entailed in the word murder and in the notion of the unmourning Thames. Para. Once the grain of the poem is opened up, then it cannot long survive the deconstructive pressures brought to bear upon it and reveals itself as fractured, contradictory and symptomatic of a cultural and linguistic malaise. A three-step model like this will lend itself to applications to other material. It gives this approach something distinctive as a critical practice and lays the strengths and weaknesses of deconstruction open to scrutiny, just as other methods are open. The deconstructive reading then aims to produce disunity to show that what had looked like unity and coherence actually contends contradictions and conflicts which the text cannot stabilize and contend. We might characterize it as waking up the sleeping dogs of signification and setting them on each other. In contrast, more conventional styles of close reading had the opposite aim. They would take a text which appeared fragmented and disunified and demonstrate an underlying unity aiming to separate the warring dogs and soothe them back to sleep with suitable blandishments. Yet the two methods, far apart though they would see themselves as being, suffer from exactly the same drawback, which is that both tend to make all poems seem similar. The close reader detects miracles of poised ambiguity alike in Dunn's complex metaphysical lyrics and simple poems like Robert Frost's Quote, stopping by Woods on a snowy evening, unquote, which received the full-scale explicatory treatment of the 10 or 20-page article so that the experience of reading them loses all its particularity. Similarly, after the deconstructionist treatment, all poems tend to emerge as angst-ridden, fissured enactments of linguistic and other forms of indeterminacy. Stop para. I'll comment further on some of the characteristics listed on the post-structuralist post side of the diagram on page 70, using as an example the Castaway, Appendix 3, a well-known poem by the 18th century poet William Cowper. As all critics recognize, this poem works at two levels. On the surface, it is an account of the death of man washed overboard from a ship, who speaks in the poem in his own voice and laments his fate. At a deeper level, the poem is about Cowper's own fear of an isolation within his incipient mental breakdown. Page 75, Para. For the deconstructionist, firstly exposing contradictions on paradoxes or paradoxes might involve showing that the feelings professed in a poem can be at odds with those expressed. For instance, the castaway, the speaker says that he does not blame his shipmates for his plight, but even saying this raises the possibility that he does. Thus, at one point, he says that his friends did all they could to save him, but elsewhere he implies that they desert him and hurry off to save themselves. 
look again at the poem to identify the points where these inferences might be drawn. Para, secondly, pointing to breaks, gaps, fissures, discontinuities in, is a way of implying that the text lacks unity and consistency of purpose. There may, for instance, be changes in tone or perspective or point of view. In the castaway, for instance, the text sometimes uses I and sometimes he for the man uh, lost overboard. Quote, such a destined wretch as I, unquote. But, quote, his floating home forever left, unquote, within bracket my italics. Look again at the poem and see if you can identify other examples of this. As I have already indicated at one level, it is an imaginative retelling of the death of a sailor lost overboard during one of the expeditions of the explorer George Anson based on the account of the incident on, in Anson's published journals. At another level, this is merely a metaphor for the isolation and depression felt by Cowper himself. But the relationship between these two levels is very quote, unsettled, unquote. For instance, all the specific details about Anson and his expedition distract from the generalized notion of loss, abandonment and isolation, and we shift erratically from one to the other. Para. Thirdly, the linguistic quirks which seem relevant include re several kinds of linguistic oddity or non sequitur, a c q u i t u r of the kind, which undermine secure meanings. There are many of these in the castaway. In the final stanza, the poet says that no divine assistance came when we perished each alone, but the poem has shown the death of only one person. On the other hand, if the statement is a general one about how we all have to face death alone, then we would expect the present tense rather than the past. We perish rather than we perished. Para. The term aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A, within quote, finally, is a popular one in deconstructive criticism. It literally means an impasse and designates a kind of knot in the text which cannot be unraveled or solved because what is said is self-contradictory. It perhaps corresponds, therefore, to what, page 76, British critic William Empson in his book, Seven Times of Ambiguity, Seven Types of Ambiguity, 1930, designated as the seventh type of verbal difficulty in literature, namely that which occurs when, quote, there is an irreconcilable conflict of meaning within the text, unquote. For instance, at the start of the third stanza, we, we are told of the drowned man that, quote, no poet wept him, unquote. But the existence of the poem we are reading contradicts this. There seem to be no way out of this bind. It is often said that Ronald Burdis's 1968 essay, The Death of the Author, marks the transition from structuralism to post-structuralism. And in that essay, Burdis says that in the text, quote, everything must be disentangled, nothing deciphered, unquote. The aporia, though, is a textual knot which resists disentanglement and several of the elements discussed above as contradictions, paradoxes, or shifts might equally be classified under the more general heading of aporia. Para, while it is easy to see why this process might be called reading against the grain, it is misleading to suggest that the poem has an obvious grain or overt meaning which the critic has merely to routinely counteract. Reading this poem will also have shown, I hope, that structuralist and post-structuralist reading practices are much at odds with each other. Identifying patterns and symmetries in the structuralist manner discovers a unified text which is, so to speak, happy with itself, whereas, quote, reading the text against itself Unquote, produces a sense of disunity of a text engaged in a civil war with itself. Section Selected Reading Burdis Ronald, The Pleasure of the Text, Translation R. Miller, Heel and Wang, 1975.
This book represents the playful side of birders. It is brief, enigmatic, and entertaining. Color Jonathan on Deconstruction, Theory and Criticism After Structuralism. Rutledge, 25th Anniversary Edition, 2007, includes a new prefair surveying deconstruction history since the 1980s and assessing its place within cultural theory today. The reader Jack, the exorbitant question of the exorbitant stop, question of method, I think some printing mistake is there, pages 157 to 164 in, of Grammatology, translation, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, Johns Hopkins University Press, 1976. Derrida Jack, Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences, reprinted in abbreviated form in K. M. Newton's 20th Century Literary Theory, A Reader, Macmillan, 1988. Page 77, Derrida Jack, The Purveyor of Truth, pages 173 to 212, in the Purloined Po, Lacan, Derrida, and Psychoanalytic Reading, edited John P. Muller and William J. Richardson, Johns Hopkins University Press, 1988. This essay is Derrida's response, fully introduced within the volume, to Lacan's reading of Poe's story. The purloined letter, this uh, Poe's story, quote, the purloined letter, unquote. This and the two previous items constitute suggested initial reading of Derrida. Derrida Jack, a Derrida reader, edited by Peggy Kamuf, K-A-M-U-F, Columbia University Press, 1998. An assisted introduction, a substantial selection of Derrida's essays, each with its individual introduction. A very useful book for sustained engagement with Derrida. Deutscher, D-E-U-T-S-C-H-E-R, comma, Penelope. How to read Derrida, Granta Books, 2005. A good place to begin with Derrida, this short book is one of the How to Read series, representative of a recent trend towards ultra-brief introductions. Jefferson, Anne, and Robey, R-O-B-E-Y, David, edited, Modern Literary Theory, Cologne, a uh, Comparative Introduction, Batsford, 2nd edition, 1986. See Chapter 4, Structuralism and Post-Structuralism. Leshte, L-E-C-H-T-E, John, 50 Key Contemporary Thinkers, Rutledge, 2nd edition, 2006. Short introductory essays on key thinkers of the post-war period not limited to post-structuralism and deconstruction. Norris Christopher Derrida, Fontana, 1987, A Brief and Helpful Guide. Norris Christopher, Deconstruction, Theory and Practice, Rutledge, 2nd edition, 1991, A Standard Introductory Account. Royal, R-O-Y-L-A, Nicholas, E.D., Deconstructions, a User's Guide, Palgrave, 2000, a series of well-focused essays by a range of important commentators. Sarup Madden, S-A-R-U-P, M-A-D-A-N, An Introductory Guide to Post-Structuralism and Postmodernism, Longman, 2nd edition, 1993, expanded and updated in 1993. See the chapter, Derrida and Deconstruction. Chapter 4, Postmodernism, page 78.